Our first speaker, Mr. Keith uh, Kishba. Kishba. You'll make it right. Good Cajun name. Thank God. <laughs> What's the name again? Oh, Kishbaugh. Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, Keith Kishbaugh spoke here once before. I'm running for parish council, District 1. That's mostly Karen Crow. Some of uh, north side of Lafayette, parts that go all the way up to uh, Congress. So I never wanted to get into politics, but I decided about a year ago that uh, I was just a little tired of the corruption, collusion in our city council. So it's not that we want to win the election. We got good people in here. Um, Andy needs to win, and we don't. We don't. It's, we have to win this election. Yes. Okay, we have to win this election. Okay, we're at a turning point. You know, uh, Ralph Abraham said it perfectly yesterday. We don't win this election, we're going to be in trouble. We cannot let the money machine prop up these candidates and beat us. we got to get out there in the grassroots, make phone calls. I'll be in the parish. We didn't win our lawsuit. That was well publicized. So I won't be in the, the uh, city, but Andy will be in the city. He's got to replace Bruce Conk. Yay! Um, <laughs> we convinced Dr. James Noriega, who's just jumped in full speed ahead, to run against uh, to run against Liz Webb. Okay, so that's two. We've got to get Mark Pope to win. Yes. And that'll be a majority of three out of five. Now we're going to play their game. They wanted to change things and be able to control things by ordinance. They wanted to shrink the council from nine to five so they could have three out of five controlling the $600 million a year. So we are going to take that from them, okay? We need to control the parish council. Uh, your parish council four? Four. Okay. We need to control the uh, <laughs> parish council and the city council. And like uh, last Friday, uh, we have our meetings. Uh, we're all conservatives, people running for office, uh, the different districts. You know, I basically read them a riot act, and I'll call you out. You know, I, whether I win or not, I will call you out if I'm supporting you and all these guys get elected and we don't do what we say we're going to do. We're going to do what we say we're going to do. Okay, we're going we're gonna to take care of the city, we're going to take care of drainage, and we're not going to just talk about it for three and a half or four years. We're going to do something about it. You know, we're going to take care of, you know, when I, I'm from New York City, but I've been here 45 years. I lived in Miami for two years. 45 years ago in Miami, Florida, Dade County, which is three times the size of Lafayette, you could, you could walk anywhere, take a bicycle anywhere, and not worry about getting run over. We don't even have sidewalks going all the way up and down Johnson Street. Where's our money going to? Accountability. We have the money. It's just not being appropriated properly. So if you have any friends, relatives, Anybody in Karen Crow or North Lafayette, you've got to make the phone calls. We need yard signs, um, locations for yard signs, but we need you guys to make the phone calls. If you know three people in Karen Crow, make the phone call. You know, if you're supporting our effort, you know, if you're on the other side, I'll never convince you to um, do the right thing as far as I'm concerned. I got one real quick thing I'm going to finish. We were at a limb salvage meeting the other night, and an old friend of mine, uh, who's a successful businessman, and he lives in River Ranch, and he walks up to me and says, can you believe that doctor called uh, uh, Carly a socialist? And I'm like, okay. He says, what do you think? And I said, well, I think she's beyond socialism. He said, really? I said, yeah. He says, uh, well, all the rich people are behind her. I said, uh, Neil, say that one more time. He said, all the rich people are behind her. I said, is that really what you want for your government? That's what we're up against, okay? That's it. Have a good night. Thank you. Our next speaker, Dr. James Noriaga. I think I pronounced that correct. Yes, close enough. James, <laughs> the foot dog. 
Good afternoon. He's a good foot doctor, too. Well, thank you, Mr. Brother. I appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon. I am Dr. James Noriega. I've been in practice right one block away uh, for the last 21 years. Um, I had my arm twisted to get into politics, something I never thought I would do. I've always told myself the only way I would get into politics is if I was asked to. I would never initiate it on my own. And, well, Mr. Kishbaugh came, grabbed me, pulled me out of my office and said, we're going to qualify. I said, yes, sir. So that's how I got up here. I'm running a little bit behind the ball game because I've only been doing this for about nine days now. So we're trying to catch up on all the issues that are plaguing us. And the issue that I hear most getting out there and talking to people is the drainage problem. And you look at the council records and there's a lot of talk. And there's a lot of talk and a lot of studies, but nothing's really been done. The last time the river was dredged was in 1957. After it was drained in 1957, we did not have a flood for 40 years. I think it's time we do that again and give us another 40 years. Estimated cost is going to be $25 million to dredge the river. The last time we flooded, $285 million in damage. Well worth it. Well worth it. The other things that I see in this city, besides the failing in infrastructure and our roads falling apart, is we have let our city go. Look around when you drive down the street. See the trash on the roads. See the high grass. Who's responsible for cutting the medians? My God, by my house, they're almost waist high now. That, to me, is unacceptable. Again, we have the money. We have the people to do it. I think we have a huge lack of oversight. So that is something I really want to bring to the council, is responsibility, oversight, if you say you're going to build me a million dollar building and we're paying for it with tax dollars, I want to watch that million dollar building go up. I don't want to end up with a $10,000 shed. So thank you for your time. Um, like Mr. Kishbaugh said, this is, has to be a grassroots effort. If I get every one of y'all vote, and if y'all all live in District 3, that's wonderful. But I'm still going to have to go and find about another 4,900 and 75 votes. So talk to your friends that live in District 3. Talk to your family. I am big on meet and greets. If you want me to come to your neighborhood, I'll do a meet and greet anytime. Um, of course, not during clinic hours or when I'm in <laughs> surgery, but any other time. Um, we'd love to serve you as a council member, and uh, we hope to make an effective change in the city. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, will be Mr. Nakan. Andy Nakan. Andy Nakan. The Andy Nakan. The Andy Nakan. The Ray Graves. Say it as such. Uh, thanks for having me. It's good to see everybody again. It's good to be back. Uh, I have to honor these two gentlemen, Keith Kishbaugh and Dr. Noriega, and John, I don't think you've ever served either, for stepping forward. Um, and these are guys that basically have taken the bull by the horns and decided to make a change, to make a difference. Uh, you got to respect that. Keith, you got to go. See you later, Thank you, Andy. Take care, brother. Yeah, have a good one. Well, All right. Oh, yeah. And, you know, considering the fact that we're all basically not politicians. None of these guys here are really politicians. You know, we're here because we respect you. We're here because we respect your money. We're here because we respect this city. I mean, I, I've been here since 57. Uh, I moved here from uh, Kenner. I was three years old. South College was a two-lane gravel road. Uh, Black and Coliseum was the city limits. And this city had a lot to offer than it does today. You know, there was a lot more then it seemed like even though we had less there was more mm -hmm. and now we have more but we all have less why is that you know it's common sense it's it's, it's doing things that are right it's, it's heading in the right direction and uh, I, I was lucky enough to serve four years I thoroughly enjoyed that I enjoyed being there but 
being one of only three like-minded people on that council, we could get nothing done. It was always a fight to get anything done. Even when money was appropriated, that check wasn't signed. And that's one thing the mayor president has the authority of, is if he don't want to sign the check, the money don't get spent. And we, I ran across that more than once. Uh, and it hurts. It hurts those people representing those districts because they say, well, nothing's getting done. Well, there's reasons for it, you know. But yet, you look at all the other projects, all the fluff and the whipped cream and everything else that was done without the infrastructure and the concerns that need to be addressed. We were spending money on dessert. We didn't have any meal to service, but that dessert sure was getting put on that table. You know, and that's a shame when, when you're basically doing that to the people of your, of your city and, and your parish. Um, we've got to address the important issues that are there. And there's so many. And one thing we need to look hard at is, is the money. Follow the money. We gotta see where it's going, see where it's spent. When I was just, one thing I know, in the last budget meetings I sat in was regarding, uh, in particular, communications. They used to have a, each department has its own communication budget and there's a lot of different departments. I mean, most of them went from $1,000, $1,500 to $10,000, $15,000. These are no big contracts. Why did it go up so much? Fiber needed the money. So your money was going from your tax dollars to the city to support fiber through the local government. And that's just one portion of the government. You're not talking about you know, the police and everything else that goes into involved in this. So it's, uh, there's a tangled web in there. And we need to get through that web and find out where we need to go honestly with what you guys deserve to have our city where it needs to be to grow. The whole purpose of government is to sit there and spend the money properly to give you guys the opportunity to excel. It's not up to government to pick who's going to win and lose. It's up to you guys to win and lose. All we do is provide the tools out there so you can get there. We get out of your way. You know, that's the whole point. Is let the private sector do what they got to do to win. And uh, we got to start winning again. You know, we can't sit there on the back burner and keep saying, well, we're the happiest city in the USA. Yeah, but in the meantime, everybody's flooding down the south or down north. You know, I mean, it's just, we can't be that happy. Not if everybody's underwater. So anyway, thank you guys. I, I want you all support. I'm asking for your vote. Uh, call me. I'm, I have a campaign number now. And, and one thing I wanted to mention, too, is Dr. Noriega, myself, Keith, we all are full-time workers. I mean, obviously, he has a medical practice. I am very busy selling building materials. I mean, my day is full from 7 to 5 every day. Uh, Keith Kishbaugh is a builder, so he is very full up. So we'll do all we can to contact you guys, but I don't think we'll be knocking on a lot of doors, unfortunately. That's something I'll enjoy doing, but we all jumped in late, uh, so I don't expect to have time to get out there and see everybody, but please call me. I have a campaign number. We're supposed to be on my Facebook. Leslie, I don't know if it's up yet or not. But uh, we'll get it posted. That phone is strictly for calls. So call me anytime. And please, just not after 9 o'clock. <laughs> What's that number? Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I'd have to look it up because I don't even have Matt Leslie. You have that number I sent you? Let me look for it real quick. Thank you. It's 852 something or other. 7475 or 7574. 852 7574, maybe. I'll have to look for it. Sorry. I thought you were faster than that. Come on, girl. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if y'all will send me, all of you who are running, if y'all will send me some information, I will just forward it to people. We can't That'd be great. support one person or the other, but I can put out information so that people know what's going on. Yeah, that would be great. That would be and great. what district are you in? Two. District 2, which basically is, is still the heart of the city for the most part. You know, this is District 2 right here. We're sitting in District 2. Thank you, District 2. Thank you guys very much. Leslie, do you find it yet, I guess, huh? Okay. Thank you all very much. I'll announce it. Y'all take care. And Carol. Oh, by the way, 36 years of service. That's pretty amazing. I have to admit. I can't be as good as I get out of We have this young lady, uh, Diana Leonard. Yes. You're running for uh, school board district eight, I believe. Would you like to say, say a couple of words? Sure. Come on up. Sure. 
I'm just going to say a couple words. No. My family is from there. No. I'm married to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's not here either. So. My name is Diana Lennon, and I am in District 8 for the school board, and I am running for the school board in um, Eric Knezik's seat. Um, I have not, also had not planned on being in politics, but uh, I had people ask me, I've thought about this for a long time, and the time was right. I just, my youngest just left, graduated Lafayette High, and is now at LSU. So um, what I'd like to do is, I think there are a lot of good things happening in our parish that we can not reinvent the wheel. We can look at things that we're doing, best practices in other schools, perhaps try some of these things out in the schools that we have here. Um, I'm also very creative. I like the cooperative agreement, uh, the cooperative endeavors, intergovernmental agreements. There are lots of things we can do to work with our business partners. We need to work with One Acadiana, Lita, and the university to grow the economy. We need to find out what companies are coming in, what do they want in a school, and we need to try to meet those needs so they can bring their businesses here and help us grow the economy. Um, the other important point is post-secondary education. We have got to get kids from high school graduated, first of all, which the graduation rate has increased, uh, high school to career technical uh, industry-based certification or to college may work. We have some good programs already at W.D. Smith where they're learning um, industry-based, work-related skills, and uh, the Early College Academy, where in four years a kid can go through high school. When he graduates, he has an associate's degree and he has a high school degree. So um, I hope you consider me. I'm a mom. I'm a public school product. My grandparents and parents were educators. Um, I believe in public education, and I really want to make some positive changes. So. Call me if you need. I have a Facebook, uh, Facebook slash Elect Lennon, and I'm working on my website. So, thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did you have a couple words you'd like to say? Oh, I've something to say. Well, that's all right. As long as you don't fuss at us, we'll have you up here. <laughs> No, you're on all alone. But you know, you know what's really amazing to me is um, is is the amount of want and desire to be able to serve the community. Everyone I spoke this evening is someone that has not been in politics, and frankly, I haven't been in politics either. Uh, my name is Jim Dore. I'm running for state representative in District 31, and I like you have uh, each one of you who stood here before me um, have have actually either left the state, moved around, and. And in my case, I've moved to Texas, went to Florida, came back, and Louisiana just hasn't changed. Um, and I, when I came back, I, I began to watch my grandchildren and began to become very concerned about the future for the, uh, of, of those young people that, you know, that will eventually become the leaders of, of, our, of our state, and certainly right here in, in Lafayette. <clears throat> for me, there are a few things that are important. Um, and, it's, and I look at the world a little bit differently. And that is that, the, that education is the underpinning of everything that we do. It, and it's going to be able to help our workforce. I think it has a lot to do with keeping people um, actually uh, from becoming incarcerated. If we're giving the right leadership and teach them very early and very young what their values are. I'm, a, I'm a, happen to be a function of a, uh, a I mean, a, a, the result of a poor functioning educational system in Algiers, Louisiana, just is right across the street from a uh, river, rather from uh, from New Orleans. <coughs> I struggled through school. Um, I did get an associate's degree, then later went back to school to get, um, to get my, uh, uh, I guess my, my degree, especially in, excuse me, in, uh, in general studies, and in 19, and when I was 59, I went back to get a degree and, uh, and my master's, my master's degree. So I had to return to school and play catch up my entire life because of a poor base, uh, base, uh, baseline of an education, which is kind of horrible. But I think if we have a good educated workforce, um, then I think we could begin to draw and bring in new business. If we can bring new business back into Lafayette and into, into Louisiana, it increases the tax base. If we have a tax base that begins to increase, we have a better economy. If we have a better economy, then I think we can draw more business and we get more educated people and we can bring in more industry. And, and basically, I, I look at it as, a, as somewhat of a flywheel. Uh, and, but the baseline is to have an educated a group of young people coming out of school where we can actually develop a solid workforce. This didn't happen overnight. It's going to take us quite a long time to undo what's been done. 
And right now we're, what, 48 in education. We're 50th overall in the nation. Uh, we're 46 or 47 in infrastructure. Um, our economy, if we looked at economy, I think we're around 45. I heard a worldwide economist today give a speech in New Orleans. That's why I'm a little bit late and talking on a speed at the, I get the sound of the, uh, the, the, I don't even know what you say, at the, uh, the sound of speed or whatever it is. Because I'm still doing 90 on the interstate trying to get here. Because uh, I didn't want to miss tonight. But the fact is, we have to change the state and, and, and we have to change what's happening right here in Lafayette. And this is a really important place to the entire area of Louisiana. Uh, we're very proud and I'm really worried about, about the culture. I'm worried about our economy here. Um, and I'm worried about all the things that are happening with the loss of oil and gas jobs. Um, and I'll leave you with a couple of stories. I've been meeting with tons of people um, to talk about what I believe to be some changes needed here in Louisiana. All the oil and gas lawsuits that have been happening and, and the legacy lawsuits as well as the coastal lawsuits, real or factual, has caused people to lose their jobs here, right here locally. I had I'd met with actually a young man who, who left the oil and gas industry and bought a tire repair. Actually, it's Ross Tires, what he bought. And I was chatting with him. I said, hey, tell me a little bit about your business. He said, well, you know, we're a little bit slow. I said, well, has oil and gas had an impact on your business? He said, you know, Jim, it has been a very interesting thing. I said, well, how so? We had an individual that had come in, service his vehicle. He needed to have his brakes repaired. Told him all about it, said here's what it's going to cost, and he elected not to even repair his brakes. He didn't have the money to do it. That's what pe our people are being faced with today here in, in, in Lafayette. You know, the, the, uh, the overshadowing results of what's happening in oil and gas has now resulted in struggling in not just oil and gas companies, but it's gone well beyond that to restaurants, to Auto, automobile repair companies, tire companies, and things of that nature. So we're all feeling it, and it's horrible. But thanks again uh, for letting me come in. Sorry, I was starting out at 100 miles an hour, but I just landed <laughs> with my vehicle here. Um, and John, thanks for running. I mean, I think the world of you. You know that. Um, and again, thanks for letting me uh, have a few minutes of your time. Thank you. We're having uh, Mr. Mr. Gilbo uh, speak with us in just a couple minutes. John Gilbo is running for the office of the Lafayette Parish Council District 4. John was born and raised in, in Acadiana and began his public service as a volunteer fireman in his hometown of Karen Crook in the early 1960s. A USO graduate, he completed his professional career as a senior administrator with the Louisiana Department of Education. John worked in the Department of Education for many years. During that time, he held many positions within the Department of including Deputy Superintendent, Management and Finance Assistant Director, Job Training, Partnership, Supervisor, Teacher Certification and Higher Education at Director, Federal Programs and Technology, to just to name a few. When called to duty, John proudly served our country in the U.S. Navy and has been actively engaged in this community for years. John will work for us tirelessly. He embraces investing our communities in growing relationships. He has served on parish commissions and, co and committees, giving of his time and energy freely for the improvement of our communities. He is keenly aware of our needs and the issues as a result of this public service. His focus shall be on our neighborhoods and a government that works for us and that empowers we are we the people. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Sure. Good evening. Again, just to remind you, I'm John Gilbo, Republican candidate, Lafayette Parish Council, District 4. My desire to serve is guided by my faith, values, and you, the citizens. I'm really humbled and thankful for this opportunity, and I do want to serve as your parish councilman, District 4. I am the son of Mr. and Mrs. Carol E. Gilbo. My father served as town clerk, alderman, and fire chief. Both parents were the epitome 
of public servants in their community of Karen Grove. I was born and raised in, a, in Acadiana, and I began my public service as a volunteer farmer in my hometown of Karen Grove in the early 1960s. I am a USL and University of Tennessee graduate, and I completed my professional career as a senior administrator with the Louisiana Department of Education. When called to duty, I proudly served my country in the United States Navy. And to this day, I continue to actively engage, be engaged in my community. Here's what I see. An everyday Christian, a family man, a conservative that will work for you tirelessly, full time. I am a communicator who places a high premium on being a good listener. I am a doer, and I will dig in and fight for the citizens. First, I must say I am not a worm. Second, my colors do not change. I do not back down when it comes to asking the hard questions. I am not afraid to challenge one to fully justify the need to engage in an activity or a project. And the typical response, well that's the way it has always been done, is not, is not an acceptable answer for me. I plan on making decisions based on data provided through fact gathering, informed input, as well as discussions with the professionals and you, the public, to arrive at an agreeable solution that will best balance the needs of constituents with available resources. Do not, do not expect to buffalo your way through me with a bunch of fluffy rhetoric. No pre preaching for this guy, just facts. My professional experiences with the Louisiana Department of Education have more than prepared me for the duties and challenges of parish council. I offer to you the experiences of an extended generation. I like to say that I am a li like a library filled with volumes of wisdom and knowledge. I have the passion to serve for the betterment of our communities as a whole. This passion comes from the desire to leave our communities better for generations to come. I want to be the voice of the people, delivering to you a government of the people. Do understand, I am not seeking office for personal benefit. The reward is in the giving of my time. I believe we are at a crossroads. I have the experience the dedication, the knowledge, and passion to work with other elected leaders and citizens to move us in a direction that we can all be proud of. A friend once commented, and I quote, John is built for service. That has been the story of his family through the generations. As a public servant, I have been making the citizens' interests a life work. I am that person who has a goal of solving problems based on common sense, logic, and best judgment. As a council, we should be here to help citizens, not battle you in your struggles. I will assemble a district think tank group that is representative of the community that will be given the charge to advise me on key issues throughout my term of office. I will use social media to inform citizens on council events through the use of the 555 approach, text 5, tell 5, invite 5. My friends, we need to work as one. Regardless of your stripes, we must work for the common good of all. We should not have to be reminded that government is informed by the business community and you, the citizens. Open dialogue must be established, and we can establish that dialogue through a simple communicative process. I will advocate for the establishment of a permanent oversight function 
with authority to review and recommend on the stripping and transferring of excessive surplus funds from programs. I will advocate for close scrutiny of our zoning process. As soon as a new business venture opens up in the unincorporated of the area, guess what happens? The cities gobble it up even before the doors even open up. Immediate loss of revenue for the unincorporated areas of the parish. This is not sustainable. I will advocate for consideration of privatization of delivery of goods and services where it is advantageous and cost-effective, public-private partnerships. I will actively engage with COG, Council of Governmental, meeting with parish elected officials to understand needs and how we can partner for the betterment of our communities. I will urge consideration of intergovernmental agreements with local municipalities to relax policy procedures that could allow for mixed and flexible uses of resources for the betterment of the whole. These municipal agreements should be evaluated in terms of lower costs, added value, or improved service levels, regardless of established protocol and how it was done in the past. Ronald Reagan once commented, and I quote, government's first duty is to protect the people not, not to run their lives. I am tired of a government that has a model of up-down when it should be down-up. It is time that we all understand the meaning of the word transparency. We are well equipped to inform our officials. Our elected officials must, however, give us that opportunity to engage in meaningful dialogue. And let me post a warning, blasting unkind words, taking a pessimistic view, spouting poisonous messages will do little to foster a cooperative relationship. It is time to take a constructive approach to identifying solutions. It is time for positive messaging where we come together to work out issues collectively. Again, when elected, I will serve as a full-time parish councilman. Yes, we are faced with a host of needs, but all needs cannot be priorities. Let me repeat, all needs cannot be priorities. There should not be any fairy tale expectations when we go to the table. We shall go through a needs assessment model that lists needs versus priorities that is realistic, that is cost-effective, that is flexible in order to address emergencies or changes, and that evaluates progress. Okay. We set household goals based on available funds and resources. Why wouldn't we have that same expectation of our government? We shall address the whole problem and not just the belly button of the problem. I do not embrace a piecemeal approach to solving problems. I value and very much enjoy the riches of our community. It is important that we realize that the role of government is not here to solve every problem or dictate to the citizens. Friends, it is time to turn the page on the past with leadership being priority number one. Leadership that is representative of the people. Fair, open-minded, compassionate, reasonable thinkers with a strong vision for growth will have to prevail. Officials who show leadership qualities, enthusiasm, integrity, communication skills, loyalty, empowerment, charisma, can inspire citizens and communities to accomplish great things. A footnote to leadership. A good leader has the courage to fail. A good leader has the courage to fail. One cannot win all the time, but the win is in knowing that we collectively gave it our all. 
People will engage when they feel part of and value what they help to build. As I love President Donald Trump once remarked, and I quote, it is time to transfer the power back to you, we, the people. We will establish a budget supported with sustainable revenue that allows us to live within our means. Spending must match revenues. I like to say we have a spending problem and not a revenue problem. We shall begin with a zero-based budget. We shall use one-time, non-reoccurring funds for one-time projects only. We must identify, evaluate, and support efficiencies in operating costs. These efficiencies may include eliminating duplicated efforts, installing automation, or reordering priorities to better use of our available resources. It is time to realize that budgeting is a process, an ongoing process, that does not end with budget approval. Ongoing budget review is necessary, is absolute. We need assurance that our audit procedures are in place to allow for constructive recommendations and solutions. We must tap our state and federal lawmakers for assistance in securing funds to help with our priorities. Find those earmark funds and bring them back into our communities. Final comment on funds. I am tired of lawmakers, or bureaucrats for that matter, referring to funds, be it local, state, or federal, as their funds. Hear me, hear me well. Those funds are the people's bank. The fix in the budget gaps, we must gain the trust of the people bankers. We need to spend time with the people bankers engaging them in conversation. And we need to reach out to our municipality bankers through collaborative efforts. Families first, <coughs> families first. We will strengthen our infrastructure to include drainage, roads, and bridges by establishing sustainable funding. Drainage must be viewed as a regional project where we partner with our neighboring parish governments and we must work within our own parish, the five districts, for the betterment of all, not in isolation. We shall continue ongoing drainage maintenance projects. We shall continue to identify drain trouble spots, conduct damage assessments by staff and our citizens. We need to explore federal aid for water intrusion to redirect the flow of water into the basin or other outlets. We need to support local efforts like dredge the vermilion. Another footnote to infrastructure. A problem I have seen over the years, or the past years, is that construction in this parish is far outpacing the infrastructure build out Yes, growth is nice, growth is welcome, but the infrastructure cannot handle the rapidity of that growth. We're building so quickly the infrastructure cannot keep up. We shall continue our efforts to diversify our economy, and to do so, we must put our best foot forward. We do so by embracing the four pillars of a healthy community, economy, infrastructure, public safety, and education that is fueled by you, the citizens. I often question, are we over-regulated? Is our infrastructure adequate? Is access to credit sufficient? Is our labor market flexible enough? Is the entrepreneurial environment encouraging enough to attract new business, to grow our economy? I sometimes feel that we are so focused on the public sector, and don't get me wrong, rightly so, 
that we have forgotten and have not given sufficient attention to the private sector in our economic growth efforts. Thus the importance, the urgency of correcting those things that plague our communities so we can better focus on economic gro growth. We must make certain that our family-friendly neighborhoods, our communities are safe to include fire protection, law enforcement, paramed paramedic services. We cannot allow zip codes to define one's destination in our communities. We must remove barriers, bad bridges, substandard roads, and lack of sidewalks in order to allow citizens to easily move from within and out. We must strive together to raise the living standards for our citizens. Let us become a partner in this new form of government. Our heroes are among us, teachers, plumbers, clerks, accountants, lawyers, and doctors, nurses, homemakers, mothers, fathers, and yes, our youth. Their boundless hearts should inspire us all. We can improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods through people-focused programs and strong community relationships, partnerships with fire, police, and the private sector. We need to reduce blight by enforcing codes, overgrown lots, vacant buildings, junk motor vehicles, and more. Our fire and police services must have the resources, manpower, equipment, training, but more importantly, the right resources to do their job. Certainly you would not give a baseball catcher an infielder's glove when he needs a catcher's mitt, would you? Opportunities for continuous training and to train not only the, for the normal situation, but the unusual situation must be on the training docket. Our responders must continue to work and train together as a team to ensure their ultimate mission, keeping the community safe. Folks, we cannot forget our volunteer forces in this equation. Time constraints, resources, funding, leadership weigh heavy on the effectiveness of our volunteer forces in our communities. Sad but true, these men and women receive very little recognition for their community service. I can reflect on the days when I served as a volunteer fireman with limited equipment, homemade equipment in many cases, as well as limited funding, manpower, and training. We were tasked with fully involved house fires, car accidents where we had to extract humans, rescuing children in burning houses, alarms going off at all hours of the day and night. We did the best we could, but many times our best, unfortunately, was not good enough. Our responders should not be placed in that predicament because of the lack of. We must believe in us. We cannot give up on ourselves, and it all begins by electing responsible leadership. My time served on parish commissions and committees have better informed me as to the needs, the issues facing our parish. The challenges of our new government are many, many, from budget to organization to processes to, who knows, potential legal challenges to the ability to work with all six municipalities to coordinate services. We have major concerns facing us in the way of the correctional center, the courthouse complex, fire services, water management in this parish. So where do we go from here and when? First and foremost, elect John Gilpo, parish council, October 12th. Then we turn our full undivided attention to our neighborhoods, our communities, making certain that we have in place a government that works for you, that empowers you, the people. Our efforts should not and cannot be focused on a segment of our community, but one that considers our entire community of families. We must work with the whole of our parish, and to do so with respect and compassion. 
We must elect leaders that are thoughtful, not reckless in judgment and action. In our quest for greatness, where do you stand? Let us become a part of the greatest story ever told. Unite as one to greatness on behalf of the citizens of Lafayette Parish. We will invest, embrace investing in our communities, growing relationships. The voice of the people must be heard. We need to be forward thinking in our actions. Become those dreamers and no longer accept status quo. I believe our parish can be better. I want more for you, for the citizens now and into the future. However, we will not get better unless we all get into the game. What will you bring to the table in our efforts? Will you be an active, an active player or one that just warms the bench? The spirit of Acadiana will never waver, should never be compromised. Every day, every day is a gift. And what we bring to the table will make it that much more special as we build our communities, our communities in the image that we desire that reflects the joie de vie lifestyle of our citizens and not the dictate of government or the vision of some remote community in another part of this country. We will get things done, create opportunities where there is strength, where there is unity, where we work as one. We must be proactive and not reactive in our actions. Folks, we cannot give up on ourselves. No one can change the direction of our communities like we the citizens. We can be the cure of those ailments within our communities. We need to be that creator of our future. I want to help craft that future. Will you help me? I extend my appreciation to all who have come before us to make our communities better. The footprints have been laid. Let us build on that foundation. Our future rests with the voters. I value the chance to work with you and serve you, delivering on my conservative principles rooted in me from a very early age and are very much a part of who I am today. I have a question for you. Do you want positive change in your government? Sure. If so, I have a not-so-secret not code I'd like to share with you. And please, I'll ask that you please share this code with family, friends, and neighbors. Here it is. V underscore O underscore T underscore E underscore vote vote thank you for your time merci beaucoup well, you don't sound like you're just getting in the you sound like you've been there for 25 years I have never run for political office never had a desire until all of this stuff started happening so you did a great job thank you appreciate it I'm passionate about what I want to do you have an opportunity to ask a specific question, and, and we'd like you to come up and ask that question, and you'll be happy to answer it. Me. 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 Maybe the question would be important. <clears throat> but uh, no questions out there? You covered everything. What Would you please come up? Podium, please. Oh, thank you. I was just going to ask it really quickly, then I'll come up. Come on, come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just don't think I'm clear on who do you have an opponent, John, or um, or not. I wasn't sure if, if there is somebody else. Yes, I do have another opponent. Um, he's he's a young man that uh, lives in the city, and um, I think it's his first adventure into the the waters of the political arena. Um, you know, I, I, I've got to, you know I've never been on this side of the table, you know, as a politician. And I don't really like to call myself a politician. I, I believe I'm a public servant. And that's all I've done. My father was 
you know, he never said he was a politician, but he ran for public office, very successful. I've had other relatives that have done the same. We never characterize ourselves as a politician because there's that connotation that it was ooh, kind of taboo. You know, you don't want to be a politician. And I'm not that. But I am a public servant, and I look forward to serving you in that capacity. Is your opponent a Republican, though, or a Democrat? You know? uh, is he a Republican? Or? I understand he is a Republican. Okay. I was just curious, because I didn't know. There's a big difference. <laughs> What's that? There's a big difference between a Republican and a Democrat. Yes, sir, I understand. John, you have less than two months make yourself stand out and be an issue. Same thing as Lennon. We need strong leaderships, not so much going to go along with committees or do what these entrenched bureaucrats want. We need a leader, somebody's going to stand out, let's do this, and then follow it through. What I've been hearing tonight, we need, we need to get out there, make yourself a footprint, make it solid, stand behind it. Mr. Larry, I'm going to respond this way, and I appreciate your comment because I've always felt like, even my in my employment, especially with the Louisiana Department of Education, I had the opportunity to, on many occasions, appear before legislative committees and even at the national level. And we did put our foot down, but you know, the the politicians are tough up there. You know. But I, I think all of that has been a learning experience for me, and I recognize what you say, and I do appreciate that. Uh, I don't have a Shaquille O'Neal 15, 16 foot size shoe, but I have a big enough one to, to stomp, and I'll look forward to it. And I, and I think the people who, who have gone before us, you know, when we've gone before legislative committees and the State Board of Education and so forth, they, they, I think, had a lot of respect for the way I approached it because I was, by the rules, this is the way it is, and this is the best course of action that we should be taking. And I wasn't challenged that much on that. And it was out of respect. And I think that's important to gain the respect of our public and our, our fellow... Uh, Do not appease the bureaucrats. Find I'm, your path and stick to it. Well, and, and remember what I said throughout the presentation. I, I don't think it's... The government's job to tell us how to do our job or how we should build our communities or, or any of those things. I think it's up to the people. The people should have that voice. We should be directing those politicians or those public servants and not them telling us how to do our job. We are, we are, we are as well informed as those people that sit in any one of those chambers. And the other thing I have a real problem is now that you got me started, is all of these contracts that we've got to put out there, and we don't even, we have experts here in the, in the city. We had the same issue with the state. We had good, good test takers, uh, you know, writers, and you know, all these, we had experts. You know where we'd go? Texas, Ohio, California. We'd bring all of these yahoos from the other part of the country. Right. And you know what? Those were expensive contracts. We're talking about millions of dollars. And we've got individuals like some of those who are serving on a dredge of the Vermilion. Those guys have their act together, folks. These are the kinds of people that we need to involve our, in, in our decision making. They're the ones I want to turn to. I don't need to talk to Texas or Ohio or New Jersey, whatever. We've got to get people here. We can run a shallow water dredge right up the Vermilion. Some areas it's only this deep. Some places it's 15 foot deep. Shallow water dredge would level that out. I, I absolutely agree. And, and you know, all the money that we've wasted on all these other projects, shame, shame on us. And it was the same thing with the state. We did the same thing. I, and I'm going to end on this one. I've got to tell you this story because it, it, it's, it's already always been in my claw. Okay, I'm wrapping it. Keep going. We, we, we would give to, um, through the legislature, they would assign X number of dollars to special interest projects okay now this is a true story now one of those projects was in the city of new orleans there was several of them but there was one because that project was assigned to me for monitoring evaluation and so forth it came to me and there was the address on the the form and everything so we did it all we cut the check for i think it was 100 125 000. we sent it there and it was came back undeliverable 
Guess what? And it wasn't a mistake like they said it was. It went to a vacant lot. True story. Those kinds of inefficiencies not only happen at the national and state, but it's here in Lafayette Parish. We need to get a handle on it. Enough is enough. Are you for term limits? Yes, sir. Good. Even the Supreme Court. Do you remember the I-10 connector controversy? Well, there's been so much of it. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Where do you want to start? I, I agitated, trying to find out. said the contracts have been signed. And I said, well, who signed them and when did they sign them? Couldn't even get the names of the persons that signed the contracts. That's been buried in bureaucratic wind somewhere. Well, and there again, we have no-bid contracts all over the place like um, was mentioned earlier. You know, we, we've got these contracts. We need to expose these kinds of things. You know, I never heard of where the mayor, I, I, if I'm correct, he signs off on all the contracts. It's basically his decision, as I understand it. I, I couldn't believe that. In the, in the State Department of Education, as big as that bureaucracy is, the state, we had uh, anything over $2,000 had to go before the State Board of Education and others. We couldn't do it internally unless it was 2000 less. But we're talking about hundreds and thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. Makes no sense to me. Where, you know, where's the accountability, folks? Why aren't we demanding these kinds of things? So you're doing good? No, oh, you're going to continue? <laughs> they may have heard another. Any, any uh, additional questions? Here we've got another, got another politician uh, over here. Yeah. Where at? Yeah, he thinks he wants to be something. Come, come on up and say something. Yeah, he thinks he wants to be something. Yeah, he thinks he wants to be something. Yeah, he thinks he wants to be something. I appreciate it, but Ella, don't you yell at me. I'm actually on the agenda here in a couple of weeks, so I don't want to take up too much time. But I am Josh Guillory. Oh, see, I'm getting fussed at you. You just hit the nail on the head, though, about the contracts with the mayor president. 100% you put me on the record, I support that. Okay, I might be the only guy in America running on platforms that take power away from this position, but it's important. But I am on the agenda in a couple weeks, so out of respect to the club and respect to, to time, I will defer. But I am Josh Gillery. I humbly ask for your support. God bless you. For what? <laughs> you didn't say that's for what? That's the shortest one I've ever heard. Yeah. That's, that's a lawyer and a politician giving the microphone back. <laughs> in deep time. Conservative in every manner. Position they for. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Mayor President, last year, Mayor What position are you running for? Give him the address to get to this and when it'll be ready. You better get back up yeah. I'll give you some more time. I am running for Lafayette Mayor President. I would be honored to serve in, in that capacity. I am on the agenda. September 16th. September 16th, and I'm excited. So everybody watching, come back out September 16th and to all the meetings. I really appreciate what you guys do. I'm serious. I love this group. It's one of my favorite meetings that I go to. So again, Josh Guillory, Mayor President, humbly ask for your support and support this young, young man too. And there's some other good uh, public servants as well. Thank you, Thank you very much. Young man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just had one question. Oh, yeah. Will you recycle glass? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, and you know, and the reason I was hesitant, I, you know, I, when I moved from Baton Rouge after I retired, we collected everything, plastic, metal, glass, the whole nine yards. I get over here, it's not the case. I don't, I don't get it, okay? I don't get it. Um, the only concern I would have is if we added glass to the recycling, how much is that contract going to go up? <laughs> no, I, I know. And, and that's, you know. Yeah, you know, but every, every time you turn around, it seems like we're having to pay more when we shouldn't have to be doing those kind of things. Yeah, come on. I'll share it with you. I'm, I'm kind of trying to bait you here because this is the, a, a, t a topic I've been researching. There is um, a worldwide shortage for sand. I mean, sand, it doesn't seem like silica would be much we use in our life. It's the number four element in everything we do. Think about all the roads that's been paved. 
buildings built, all the cement stuff going. We're taking our glass, which is basically formed silica, and we're not crushing it, and we're burying it in the ground. If this shortage keeps up, I mean, in some countries there are mafia operations that actually go out after it with guns and shoot each other to get it. It's, it's, yeah, contractors are barking for this stuff. It seems to me we took the LUS project here in Lafayette, thought it out ourselves, kind of like a little baby, and made a profit-making venture out of it. I, I've seen little rock uh, tumblers. And if you put the rocks in there and leave it grind enough, it's sand. <laughs> And I'm thinking, could we build one that's 50 feet high and put all the bottles in there and make sand or something? It seems to me this could very possibly be an entrepreneurial type effort where Lafayette might actually be able to kind of push it for a while and then get some entrepreneurs behind us. Would you ready? <laughs> <laughs> and and have this be a, a profit-making thing. Yeah. Uh, that's you know yeah, what, yeah, I, what yeah, I'm seeing yeah. so far. Yeah, just and, and you know to me this is one of these common sense. Um, notions you know it seems like just get a big one of these big crushes you know you're using the sugar cane field or uh, processing it and just crush that stuff I know my boys used to take a sledgehammer and they put goggles on it they crack it break the glass so they could put that much more and go sell that in cans and everything else so that made some pretty good money got daddy off the hook <laughs> Yeah, uh, this video that we're uh, showing with all of you guys, uh, that we're taking right now, will be on YouTube uh, probably by Friday night. And uh, the way you get to it is you go to YouTube, and at the top there's a search engine, more. Put in CCGG and the name of the person speaking, Mr. John, John or John Gill, or put in CCGG and today's date. And it'll it'll bring it up. You can click on it and watch it. John Gilbert, the glass crusher. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. You, you're running for public office, I'm Yes, I am. Would you please come up and introduce yourself and tell us, uh, take a couple minutes and tell us about yourself. Thank you. John? Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Carlos Harvey. I'm a candidate for mayor president for Lafayette Parish. I want to thank Ella for the uh, invite tonight and just to applaud you on your commitment to making sure that we bring ethics, that we bring trust, that we bring, bring integrity to those who hold public office. Uh, I'm in this race to become the next mayor president for Lafayette Parish, the sole Democrat running. Uh, I'm not bound by party. I feel that uh, water doesn't discriminate when it floods homes. That's why we need to fix our drainage problems. Uh, roads that have potholes affect cars that are driven by everyone. We need roads and infrastructure fixed. Uh, we need to provide better uh, services for children, youth, and families. And we also need to address the issue of neighborhood beautification. We need to make our city look like a place where people want to come, not only to visit, but a place to live. All parts, it shouldn't matter what part of the parish you live in. Uh, if you're in Broussard, Karen Crow, Doosan, Lafayette, uh, Milton, Scott, or Youngsville, all of us want a great quality of life, and that is what our team is going to bring. And finally, uh, I'm called uh, as the next mayor president for Lafayette Parish to bring community economic development. We have areas where there are stores that are opening, but I live in a neighborhood where a Walmart just closed, which many jobs left economic development left, an Albertsons closed and left, and it's at the gateway, the entrance, the front door for the city of Lafayette and Lafayette Parish. As Mayor President, I'm going to make sure that prosperity hits all corners of our parish. So I'm going to ask for your help with that. And uh, I'm in this race because I was compelled. I felt an urge to jump in, not complain from the sideline. I feel if you're going to complain, why stand on the sideline and complain about something? Why don't you put your hand in and let's make a difference? So I'm going to ask on October the 12th that you help me to help you, that we can all help us make a difference here in Lafayette Parish. Thank you so much. And before I take my seat, 
uh, you say, who is this guy? Where did he come from? Uh, I come from Goldman Street. I'm a native of Washington, D.C. I went after high school. I had a calling to the seminary to study to be a Catholic priest for the Archdiocese of Miami. I always in my heart wanted to be married. So after my se sixth year of seminary, I knew that priesthood was not an option for me. And yes. What's your name? Oh, so sorry. My name is Carlos Harvin, H-A-R-V-I-N. Thank you, sir. Yes, you're welcome. I got so fired up. <laughs> Thank you. Carlos Harvin. Can you make a roof? My wife can. I stay in my lane. My wife can cook a mean roux. So, yes, but I, I stay in my lane. And, <laughs> and I'm the second oldest of six children. We have three children. My oldest uh, graduated from Northside High School. She's a senior at UL, majoring in child psychology. Uh, my second son, uh, I want to thank Josh for his service. Thank you. My son is a member of the Army National Guard. And our youngest daughter just graduated from Lafayette High School. We'll be attending SLCC in a couple of days. So uh, that's who I am. And with your help, we will make a difference. Thank you. you yes, I am open for questions. Please do not take offense at this, but I've got to ask you a question. Since you are a Democrat, I know you can't list them, but how many of the platforms and so forth from these 20 Democratic candidates for president do you support? Wow. Mainly this one. I'm very concerned about this. How do you feel about America first? Mm. Mm. Do you know the authority for American first authority? You know where he should get the authority for that? I want to share with you the authority and let you answer. The Holy Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says, and I quote, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And we have practically every one of those 20 Democrats that are running for president that pay no attention whatsoever to America first. They're putting themselves first. Mm -hmm. And again, please, no offense, mm -hmm. but I, as a Democrat, you're the only one I think in the room. Yes. I've got to have an answer, and please forgive me if I've stepped on any toes. No offense taken. Thank you for the okay. question. Uh, what I feel about America yeah. first, uh, oh, thank you, thank you. Okay. I certainly believe that charity begins at home. Care for your own, yes. Yes. How can we provide assistance to foreign countries? How can we bring food to foreign countries? How can we bring international aid and assistance to foreign countries when we have people going hungry and homeless right here at home? So I believe America first, but not America only. Because we are a nation of, we are a world of, of we are a vi global village. So we are interdependent. We have to have allies and friends around the globe if it's an America-only mentality, I think we'll isolate ourselves. But we certainly must put our nation first, make sure our poor are taken care of, make sure our elderly are taken care of, make sure the needy and the least among us are taken care of first, and then we can extend a hand to those who are overseas and in foreign countries. Why can't you get that to Washington? <laughs> well, I I'm going to show them this card, and I'm going to do my best to do that. Thank you very much for coming Thank you. Ella, before we before closing out, would you please come up and give the next speaker, if you don't mind. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hi, everyone. The next guest speaker is going to be um, Keith Kishbaugh, and he'll be speaking on September the 2nd. It's Labor Day, but we still will have a meeting, so I hope all of you can come. Thank you. Y'all have a good evening. If there's not any additional questions, uh, I'd like to come, you know, call a closing to the to the meeting. I think we got some good information here this evening, and thank y'all for being here. And we'll see you then. Thanks. Right.